The Ancient City, Book 3, Chapter 3. The City is Formed. The tribe, like the family and the fratri, was established as an independent body, since it had a special worship from which the stranger was excluded. Once formed, no new family could be admitted to it. No more could two tribes be fused into one. Their religion was opposed to this. But just as several fratries were united in a tribe, several tribes might associate together, on condition that the religion of each should be respected. The day on which this alliance took place, the city existed. It is of little account to seek the cause which determined several neighboring tribes to unite. Sometimes it was voluntary, sometimes it was imposed by the superior force of a tribe, or by the powerful will of a man. What is certain is that the bond of the new association was still a religion. The tribes that united to form a city never failed to light a sacred fire and to adopt a common religion. Thus, human society in this race did not enlarge like a circle which increases on all sides, gaining little by little. There were, on the contrary, small groups which, having been long established, were finally joined together in larger ones. Several families formed the fratri, several fratries the tribe, several tribes the city. Family, fratri, tribe, city were, moreover, societies exactly similar to each other, which were formed one after the other by a series of federations. We must remark also that when the different groups became thus associated, none of them lost its individuality or its independence. Although several families were united in a fratry, each one of them remained constituted just as it had been when separate. Nothing was changed in it, neither worship nor priesthood, nor property nor internal justice. Curies afterwards became associated, but each retained its worship, its assemblies, its festivals, its chief. From the tribe men passed to the city, but the tribe was not dissolved on that account, and each of them continued to form a body very much as if the city had not existed. In religion there subsisted a multitude of subordinate worships, above which was established one common to all. In politics, numerous little governments continued to act, while above them a common government was founded. The city was a confederation, hence it was obliged, at least for several centuries, to respect the religious and civil independence of the tribes, curies, and families, and had not the right at first to interfere in the private affairs of each of these little bodies. It had nothing to do with the interior of a family. It was not the judge of what passed there. It left to the father the right and duty of judging his wife, his son, and his client. It was for this reason that private law, which had been fixed at the time when families were isolated, could subsist in the city, and was modified only at a very late period. The mode of founding ancient cities is attested by usages which continued for a very long time. If we examine the army of the city in primitive times, we find it distributed into tribes, curies, and families. In such a way, says one of the ancients, that the warrior has for a neighbor in the combat one with whom, in time of peace, he has offered the libation and sacrifice at the same altar. If we look at the people when assembled in the early ages of Rome, we see them voting by curies and by gentes. If we look at the worship, we see at Rome six vestals, two for each tribe. At Athens, the archon offers the sacrifice in the name of the entire city, but he has in the religious part of the ceremony as many assistants as there are tribes. Thus the city was not an assemblage of individuals. It was a confederation of several groups which were established before it and which it permitted to remain. We see in the Athenian orators that every Athenian formed a portion of four distinct societies at the same time. He was a member of a family, of a fratry, of a tribe, and of a city. He did not enter at the same time and the same day into all these four. 
like a Frenchman who at the moment of his birth belongs at once to a family, a commune, a department, and a country, the fratry and the tribe are not administrative divisions. A man enters at different times into these four societies, and ascends, so to speak, from one to the other. First, the child is admitted into the family by the religious ceremony, which takes place six days after his birth. Some years later, he enters the fratry by a new ceremony, which we have already described. Finally, at the age of sixteen or eighteen, he is presented for admission into the city. On that day, in the presence of an altar and before the smoking flesh of a victim, he pronounces an oath by which he binds himself, among other things, always to respect the religion of the city. From that day, he is initiated into the public worship and becomes a citizen. If we observe this young Athenian rising step by step from worship to worship, we have a symbol of the degrees through which human association has passed. The course which this young man is constrained to follow is that which society first followed. An example will make this truth clearer. There have remained to us in the antiquities of Athens traditions and traces enough to enable us to see quite clearly how the Athenian city was formed. At first, says Plutarch, Attica was divided by families. Some of these families of the primitive period, like the Eumolpidae, the Cecropidae, the Cephyriae, the Phytalidae, and the Lachidae, were perpetuated to the following ages. At that time, the city did not exist, but every family, surrounded by its younger branches and its clients, occupied a canton and lived there in absolute independence. Each had its own religion. The Eumolpidae, fixed at Eleusis, adored Demeter. The Cecropidae, who inhabited the rocks where Athens was afterwards built, had Poseidon and Athena for protecting divinities. Nearby, on the little hill of the Areopagus, the protecting god was Ares. At Marathon, it was Hercules. At Prasiae, an Apollo. Another Apollo, at Phileus the Dioscuri at Cephalus, and thus of all the other cantons. Every family, as it had its god and its altar, had also its chief. When Pausanias visited Attica, he found, in the little villages, ancient traditions which had been perpetuated with the worship, and these traditions informed him that every little burg had had its king before the time when Cecrops reigned at Athens. Was not this a memorial of a distant age? when the great patriarchal families, like the Celtic clans, had each its hereditary chief, who was at the same time priest and judge? Some hundred little societies then lived, isolated in the country, recognizing no political or religious bond among them, having each its territory, often at war, and living so completely separated that marriage between them was not always permitted. But, their needs, or their sentiments, brought them together. Insensibly, they joined in little groups of four, five, or six. Thus we find, in the traditions, that the four villages of Marathon united to adore the same Delphian Apollo, the men of the Piraeus, Phalerium, and two neighboring bergs united and built a temple to Hercules. In the course of time, these many little states were reduced to twelve confederations. This change, by which the people passed from the patriarchal family state to a society somewhat more extensive, was attributed by tradition to the efforts of Cecrops. We are merely to understand by this that it was not accomplished until the time at which they placed this personage, that is to say, towards the 16th century before our era. We see, moreover, that this Cecrops reigned over only one of these twelve associations that which afterwards became Athens. The other eleven were completely independent. Each had its tutelary deity, its altar, its sacred fire, and its chief. Several centuries passed, during which the Cecropidae insensibly acquired greater importance. Of this period there remains the tradition of a bloody struggle sustained by them against the Eumolpidae of Eleusis, the result of which was that the latter submitted with the single reservation that they should preserve the hereditary priesthood of their divinity. 
There were doubtless other struggles and other conquests, of which no memorial has been preserved. The rock of the Cecropidae, on which was developed by degrees the worship of Athena, and which finally adopted the name of their principal divinity, acquired the supremacy over the other eleven states. Then appeared Theseus, the heir of the Cecropidae. All the traditions agree in declaring that he united the twelve groups into one city. He succeeded indeed in bringing all Attica to adopt the worship of Athena Polias, so that thenceforth the whole country celebrated the sacrifice of the Panathenea in common. Before him, every burg had its sacred fire and its prytony. He wished to make the prytony of Athens the religious center of all Attica. From that time, Athenian unity was established. In religion, every canton preserved its ancient worship, but adopted one that was common to all. Politically, each preserved its chiefs, its judges, its right of assembling, but above all these local governments, there was the central government of the city. From these precise memorials and traditions, which Athens preserved so religiously, there seem to us to be two truths equally manifest. The one is that the city was a confederation of groups that had been established before it, and the other is that society developed only so fast as religion enlarged its sphere. We cannot indeed say that religious progress brought social progress, but what is certain is that they were both produced at the same time and in remarkable accord. We should not lose sight of the excessive difficulty which, in primitive times, opposed the foundation of regular societies. The social tie was not easy to establish between those human beings who were so diverse, so free, so inconstant. To bring them under the rules of a community, to institute commandments and ensure obedience, to cause passion to give way to reason and individual right to public right, there certainly was something necessary, stronger than material force, more respectable than interest, surer than a philosophical theory, more unchangeable than a convention, something that should dwell equally in all hearts and should be all-powerful there. This power was a belief. Nothing has more power over the soul. A belief is the work of our mind, but we are not on that account free to modify it at will. It is our own creation, but we do not know it. It is human, and we believe it a god. It is the effect of our power and is stronger than we are. It is in us. It does not quit us. It speaks to us at every moment. If it tells us to obey, we obey. If it traces duties for us, we submit. Man may indeed subdue nature, but he is subdued by his own thoughts. Now, an ancient belief commanded a man to honor his ancestor. The worship of the ancestor grouped a family around an altar. Thus arose the first religion, the first prayers, the first ideas of duty and of morals. Thus, too, was the right of property established and the order of succession fixed. Thus, in fine, arose all private law and all the rules of domestic organization. Later, the belief grew, and human society grew at the same time. When men begin to perceive that there are common divinities for them, they unite in larger groups. The same rules, invented and established for the family, are applied successively to the fratry, the tribe, and the city. Let us take in at a glance the road over which man has passed. In the beginning, the family lived, isolated, and man knew only the domestic god, thei patrui, dei gentiles. Above the family was formed the fratri, with its god, theos fratrios, uno curialis. Then came the tribe, and the god of the tribe, theos filios. Finally came the city, and men conceived a god whose providence embraced this entire city, theos poliens, penatis publici a hierarchy of creeds, and a hierarchy of association. The religious idea was, among the ancients, the inspiring breath and organizer of society. The traditions of the Hindus, of the Greeks, and of the Etruscans relate that the gods revealed social laws to man. 
Under this legendary form, there is a truth. Social laws were the work of the gods, but those gods, so powerful and beneficent, were nothing else than the beliefs of man. Such was the origin of cities among the ancients. This study was necessary to give us a correct idea of the nature and institutions of the city. But here we must make a reservation. If the first cities were formed of a confederation of little societies previously established, this is not saying that all the cities known to us were formed in the same manner. The municipal organization once discovered it was not necessary for each new city to pass over the same long and difficult route. It might often happen that they followed an inverse order. When a chief, quitting a city already organized, went to found another, he took with him commonly only a small number of his fellow citizens. He associated with them a multitude of other men who came from different parts and might even belong to different races. But this chief never failed to organize the new state after the model of the one he had just quitted. Consequently, he divided his people into tribes and fratries. Each of these little associations had an altar, sacrifices, and festivals. Each even invented an ancient hero whom it honored with its worship, and from whom, with the lapse of time, it believed itself to have been descended. It often happened, too, that the men of some country lived without laws and without order, either because no one had ever been able to establish a social organization there, as in Arcadia, or because it had been corrupted and dissolved by two rapid revolutions, as it's at Cyrene and Thurai. If a legislator undertook to establish order among these men, he never failed to commence by dividing them into tribes and fratries, as if this were the only type of society. In each of these organizations, he named an eponymous hero, established sacrifices, and inaugurated traditions. This was always the manner of commencing, if he wished to found a regular society. Thus Plato did, when he imagined a model city.